for you? Uh, we are on day three. Somebody said no. Great, you can leave now. Um, I, I will tell you, we're in rare form. We are in rare form, so buckle up, baby. Uh, buckle up, Buttercup, because uh, we got week three of our Viewpoint Message series today. And today we're going to be talking about something that, quite honestly, is a sensitive subject for a lot of people. But we don't care. Um, we're going to be talking today about giving. And here's why it's a sensitive subject. Because I guarantee you, as soon as I said we're going to be talking about giving, there was a swath of people today that their, their butts went, mm. Mm. They're going to be talking about money in church today. Now, if you said that in your brain, because I know you didn't say it out loud because I didn't hear anybody. But if you said that in your brain, this message is for you. And we'll have an altar call at the end. And you can come forward. And repent this morning. All right, come on back here. Come on now. Hold on, because listen, if we don't talk about money in church, you're going to stay chained to it. Say that. Yeah. So we're going to talk about money, but listen, giving is not just money, Corey. No. That's the problem. As soon as we say we're going to be talking about giving, everybody goes to money. And money is a huge part of generosity. But can I tell you? There is much more to giving than money. Can I get an amen from the church? Amen. See, money is one of several resources that we are given by God. And today we're going to learn how to be generous with everything God has given us. Our time, our talent, our treasure. How about this? Our attention. We can be generous people. And God calls us to be contributors. And this comes out of our, our third core value here right. at the Intersection Church. We have... Four core values, Corey. What are they? Create, connect, yep. contribute, and celebrate. Create, connect, contribute, and celebrate. So this comes out of that third core value. We want to be contributors, not consumers in our world. And we want to teach you and train you how you can be a contributor, not a consumer. And this falls perfectly in this viewpoint message series because we've been looking at four specific disciplines uh, that a believer has to have in their life. Uh, to continue to grow. One of them is fasting, which we talked about in week one. Second one is uh, uh, praying. praying, thank you, uh, that we did last week. And today we're going to be talking about giving. Next week we're going to be talking about serving, and they're not one and the same, but today we're going to be talking about giving. So listen, if you, if you are struggling with the idea of talking about money in church, just everybody take a deep breath with us. There's not going to be a second offering. We are not going to close and lock the doors until we raise a certain number of dollars, okay? Uh, in fact, we're not even going to ask you for anything. In fact, if you want to walk out with that old tired mindset, you can. But today, we're going to offer something that may be different, that might actually bring life to you. In fact, I guarantee you it will, if you have the ears to hear it today. So let's go to Matthew chapter 5, where we're going to begin today. As we talk about giving. Right. So Corey, set it up for us. Okay, so um, I don't know if you've ever kept salt long enough for it to lose its flavor. Anybody? But Jeremiah and I have had the same salt container for 20 years. What? And I went, I'm not kidding. It stayed in our pantry, literally. Yeah. And Since we were in Tennessee, it got packed away when we moved here 20 some odd years ago. So... So we, we... We ran out of salt in the house. Right. There was no salt in my shakers. And we and were like, wait a minute. <laughs> no, you tell the story. <laughs> You're doing a great job here. There's going to be an altar call after this. <laughs> anyway, so I was not feeling well. Wait, you left out the... I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was not feeling well, and I, when I'm not feeling well, I want salt. Anybody else like that? Amen. Okay. I mean, I laugh all the time. I'm like, if I could have a salt lick, she's, just she's carry it around. Seriously, with me. Like, crazy woman when she's sick. Like I just want <laughs> salt. <laughs> this is gonna be rough, guys. <laughs> we made it through the first service. I don't know if we'll make it through the second. No, I'm just kidding. I'm doing great. Yeah, you are. So, 
so anyway, so I pulled this container out of the pantry to fill up the salt shakers, and I filled it up to put salt in my soup, and I shook, and I ate, and there was nothing added. And I was like, well, that's strange. So then I, of course, licked my fingers, put them down into the salt container, and then licked the salt because I wanted salt. salt. And when I did, there was absolutely no flavor at all. It was as if nothingness, just granular things. Not like sugar that gives you sweetness. No, not, not what I needed, that wonderful salt, but it was nothing. And I was like, I have a newfound appreciation for what we're gonna read in scripture right now. Because I have never experienced salt without its saltiness. And it was literally the same week we're preaching this message. Which oh, we had planned yeah. months ago. Yeah. So, so here we are in Matthew chapter 5. This is Jesus speaking. He's preaching uh, the, the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and he's speaking to his disciples and believers. And he says in verse 13, You are the what? Salt, salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? No good. Absolutely no good. Right. Just like our thing, the 20-year-old thing. We just threw it away. It wasn't any good to us. <laughs> And he goes on and he says this question, can you make it salty again? Corey, could you make the salt salty again? No, I tried. Okay, so no. It the was, whole container. I just kept I don't, You just add salt to the yeah, salt. I don't know how that works. It didn't work. It doesn't work. That's the point. Then he goes on and says, it will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. Now, for those of us that live in the 21st century, you know, you can go to the store and buy a 99 cent salt and pepper shaker. Uh, salt doesn't have a whole lot of value, but it does when you have a bowl of soup that has no flavor. Amen? Amen. Uh, when, you, when you need or want that salt, it's really valuable to have it. But now listen, in Jesus' time, salt was excruciatingly <coughs> valuable because you couldn't just reach into the store, the local neighborhood Walmart, and, or Sam's Club and get 40 pounds of salt, right? Um, you, you, it was hard to get. And so there's a value attached to the salt for what it brings to the picture. Do you follow? Okay. So salt is valuable, not just because it's valuable, but because it brings something to the table. Right. Literally. <laughs> that was cool. That was great. It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. Verse 14. You are the light of the world. Like a city... You are the light, and you are the salt. That's important. Read on. Why'd you stop? You interrupted me. I'm just having fun with you. I know you are. Okay. Like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden, no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Y'all know that song from childhood, right? Hide it under a bushel. No! I'm going to let it shine. Okay. Intercessors, please pray. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word, God. Lord, we come with reverence and awe for who you are. Lord, Jeremiah and I, we ask now that you would allow us to fade to the back, so that you can be prevalent. Holy Spirit, speak to us and show us what we need, so that our minds, our hearts, and everything can leave this place more like you. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So now, Corey, Jesus is using these two examples. And he says, we are the light of the world and we are the salt of the earth. Now, these are two things that if you are without them and you need them, they're very valuable, right? We already established the salt thing. The light thing is very important, too. Have you ever walked through the house in the middle of the night and stubbed your toe? Right. That is a very important moment when you reach out for a light switch because... With the lights on, you're less likely to stub your toe. So it's important for us to see this because Jesus says you are like that light and that salt. You are valuable not just because you're valuable, which you are. God sees value in you whether you do these things or not. But those who go above and beyond, they're just being created and born and actually begin to give back to the people around them, they become salt and light. He says, in the end of this, he says, look at verse uh, 16. In the same way as salt and light, let your good deeds shine out for all to see. So Jesus is clearly establishing that what makes you salt and light 
in the earth is not how much you know the Bible or how much faith you have, but your good deeds that shine for all to see. Now, those good deeds come from this place of generosity where we realize that everything we have is meant to be given away. Amen. Nothing you have is for you. And if you think it is, that's because everything in the universe revolves around you. That's what happens in my heart. Can we be honest? The minute I start to see myself as the center of the universe, that's when I say, I don't need to give that away. I don't want to give that away. It's the opposite of generosity. And can I tell you something? You don't have to be rich to be stingy. You don't have to be rich to be greedy. Greed is no respecter of how much money you make or don't make. And the same is true with generosity. That's the powerful thing about the, the story we're going to jump into. Because we want to show you everything here in Scripture. That generosity is not just for once and done. It's all throughout Scripture. Yeah. So we got a story to tell, but before we get there, you've got a verse. So I'm going to be quiet. <laughs> Well, I was actually going to talk about why we give. Do it. Okay. So it's important for us to understand why we give. Um, we don't give out of obedience. We don't give out of manipulation. We don't give because we want something back, right? That's what the manipulation would be. Um, it's really important for us to understand the heart that we're to have behind giving. And so today, the thought that we wanted everybody to understand is that every act of generosity creates an opportunity for someone else to see God through our giving. So every time we humbly spend time with someone or humbly use our talents and our gifts or humbly give to someone in need, it provides an opportunity for the Lord, for the Heavenly Father to receive all the glory. Well, that's not haphazard giving. And I think sometimes in our culture, we become haphazard givers. We give because we're asked. Yeah. Or out of a sense of duty. Instead of responding, knowing humbly that it's an opportunity for God to be glorified. There's a connection that has to happen in our heart and our mind every time we give away from ourselves. So if we don't have that at work in our lives, it'll be easy for us to say, well, all the church ever does is ask for money. Because really, truly, when it comes down to it, we, we aren't generous people. We just, there's generosity, we're not allowing generosity to take root in us. And so that, that whole mindset, like if you've got that mindset, I can't help you. Other than just give you the word and show you how Jesus paid a price so you don't have to be chained to wealth and money and the need for it. There is something so much better than that. The world never was meant to revolve around money. It was meant to revolve around Jesus. What he did for us. And as he is a giver, we should also be givers. That's what makes us salt and light. And every act of humble generosity lets other people see that God is real. When you give uh, food to somebody who's hungry, they see God through you. When you give a gift, just like we did at Christmas time, to your children around your Christmas tree, when you gave them a gift, they're seeing Jesus. They're seeing generosity the way God does it in that moment. Every act of giving, humble generosity, is meant to show Jesus to the world around us. Yeah, let's look at Psalms chapter 112, verse 9 <laughs> together. It says, They share freely and give generously to those in need. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. They will have influence and honor. There's that phrase again, good deeds. Yeah, you know, sometimes we get caught on the good deeds, thinking that that's what's going to get us to heaven. Right. But this is actually a response to our belief in who Jesus is and why he came to earth. Our response is to be that flavor or that light to those around us. So the good deeds become an action of who we are. It starts with this phrase, they share freely. Now, I want you to hear this because this is exactly what you were talking about. I think a lot of people give, but they don't give freely. Yeah. Can, I, can I talk to you honest? Yeah. I think we, we give because we feel like we have to. 
most times. That's not the kind of giving that God is, is, is wanting us to achieve in our lives. He, it's, he wants it to be a response to the goodness of it that he's been pouring out in our lives. So as we give, we should give freely. Share, they share freely and give generously to those in needs. And because of their free give, their freedom in giving, everyone around them sees God through their good deeds and through their generosity. Yeah. That's, the, that's the big idea. Right, and the influence and the honor, that, that is a part of the blessings that God has for you. So we talk a little bit about, you know, how many of you know somebody that's incredibly generous? You want to be a part of what they're doing in life. You want to be around them. How many of you know somebody who is Scrooge? You don't really want to hang out with them, right? right? Or maybe you know somebody that gives you something but expects interest in return. Do you see the difference? It's important to kind of grab a hold of this because it's more about the heart and the spirit of the giver than the gift itself. And it says that when our hearts are right, when we give freely uh, and generously, then something amazing happens. It says that their good deeds will be, be remembered forever and they will be honored. And here in scripture, where we're going today, we see one of those moments where God honored the generosity, not of a wealthy donor who gave uh, millions and millions of dollars, but we're going to see that God honored the giving of a poor widow. It's found in Luke chapter 21. It's one of my favorite stories. It's only four verses long in the Gospel of Luke. But we're going to read where Jesus was watching one day uh, when people came to give. And let's see his reaction and response. Starting in verse 1. While Jesus was in the temple, he watched the rich people dropping their gifts in the collection box. <laughs> then a poor widow came by and dropped in two small coins. I tell you the truth, Jesus said, this poor widow has given more than all the rest of them. For they have given a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything she has. So you got all these, these rich people coming through, and they were giving to what we, we would call a benevolence offering. It was meant to go to the poor. So here's this poor woman who's giving to the poor. And all these rich people come through. Jesus is watching as they drop in, kind of precursory, it's like dropping a $5 bill in the bucket, bucket as it comes by at church. Kind of, hey, this is what I normally do. All these rich people were doing this, and all of a sudden, this widow uh, comes and she drops these, these coins, which were less than a penny uh, worth. They were very uh, small uh, in value in terms of their number. But for Jesus, they were the most valuable thing given at the temple that day. Yeah. And because of her sacrifice and giving, Jesus brought honor to her and brought attention to her. And to this day, we are still reading her story. Talk about their good deeds being honored and remembered. That is an example of, well, this God can do the same thing with us. And every time we give, even sacrificially, like this widow, God can use it to show himself to others. Yeah, now I, I want to talk about a couple of things that I, I think we should um, unpack a little bit. First... Um, they came to the temple prepared with their gift. I think that this is really important. When you come into God's house, if we're going to just specifically talk about giving here for a moment, there is a preparation involved with asking the Lord, how, how do you, what do you want me to give? Because when we don't do that, one of the things that happens is we become, again, haphazard with our giving. Have you ever just shown up to a, a, a service and just kind of reached into your pocket and then just dropped whatever you had or kind of just kind of, you know, said, hey, that's a 20, I'm going to give a five. So you we, know, you reach back in and you know what I mean? Like well, the that, option that's can the be, idea there. It can be haphazard with our giving because we have an abundance. Right. There's no or, decision making. Or let me just go this way. Or it could be emotional giving. Where you so are manipulated in a moment to think that you need to give. And listen, Corey and I were part of a generation where we saw that again and again. So we don't ever want anybody to give for that reason. Can you all hear that from your pastors today? We don't ever want anybody to feel manipulated into giving. That is not the kind of giving that, that, that we are talking about here. What we're talking about is where our hearts are free enough to say, you know what? Whatever God has given me, I can give to him freely of what I have, whether it's a little or a lot. 
but it's going to be sacrificial. It's going to honor God. It's going to be a, a blessing to him that my heart is connected through giving. Yeah, I am so sure that that woman had to think about those two mites, what they say is the two mites, those two pennies as all she had, and prepared herself to walk before Jesus to drop them in that bucket. And I think another element of this is Jesus was standing there watching. You know, we um, I say a lot, <laughs> uh, wash your hands and say your prayers because Jesus and germs are everywhere. Well, he, he is understanding of your giving practices with your time and your talent and your treasure. He knows our hearts. He is never interested in the amount that you are giving. He is interested in the heart behind your giving. And if we can understand our hearts is what is really the, the key to giving and seeking the Lord first, with an understanding, there, there have been times where Jeremiah and I, in our young marriage, um, uh, uh, we, we went to a church, and they would often have missionaries just kind of stop in and, and speak. And I remember specifically one time that we were down to like our last $10, and we had already prepared our gift, our tithe and our offering, to go to uh, the offering. And we had gone in with this $10 and knew that that was it, probably for about eight days. And we had no, we had nothing, nothing in the pantry. We had nothing left. But we actually said to each other, we're going to go have egg rolls and enjoy this last 10 bucks. You remember this day? And the missionary came and talked. And I kid you not, my heart was sad because... I had to make a decision to give up my egg rolls. I'm not kidding. The Lord was dealing with me. He was asking me to give my last $10. And it wasn't coming from manipulation from the platform. It was literally just God was dealing with her heart. And I remember in the same moment God was dealing with my heart because I like egg rolls too. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, Jeremiah, I feel like we're supposed to give our last $10 to this missionary. And I said, I know. And I was like, we have no food. We had nothing. Nothing to, no, nothing to go home to. And I, once again, the favor of the Lord is always amazing. Because it's faith building stories that we're able to share with you like this. But we gave that and prayed together while everything else was happening. We said, Lord, we don't know how we're eating this week. Could you please take care of us? Because we were going to do that at lunch while we ate our two egg rolls. You know, just this is it. Hurrah, you know. But we just said, Lord, we're going to give this to you and ask you to provide for us. When we got home, there were three bags of groceries sitting on our front step. We, we literally didn't talk to anybody about the gift. It was literally just God's provision. And can I tell you, when you give freely, even though you may not have a lot, Jesus will see it. And he will honor you if you give freely. Now, if you give begrudgingly or because you have to, then there's another lesson to learn. <laughs> and we've been there and done that. We've given begrudgingly or out of manipulation. And we've experienced that as well and wondered, God, where is your provision in this? But it comes down to motive and heart. And so this is a really key thing. Now, if you think about this before we go on, you know, this widow is a one example of giving in Scripture. But it's, revealed, it's, it's specifically money. But if you roll the tape all the way back to Genesis, the very first expression of worship between Abel and Cain, you see the same thing happen in a, in a moment. Now, Abel was a shepherd, and Cain was a farmer. And when it came time to give to God, it says that Cain came and kind of just dropped his stuff on the altar, kind of haphazard, like he reached into his pocket, <laughs> grabbed out a $5 bill, and threw it on the altar. And it says that Abel had prepared his gift a spotless lamb, the best of his flock, with a great heart and a great intention. And he brought that and on, with honor gave it to God. And it says that, that Abel's offering was received and Cain's was not received. Now, 
It wasn't the value of the thing given. It was the heart attached to the thing given. It was the heart to the, the act of generosity. So that's why I say, when you, if we give haphazardly or just because of rote, you know, kind of just doing it out of rote, there, there, there is something missing there. And that's what we're, we're driving at today. We want you to move beyond just that kind of giving to truly being generous and praying about together what you and as a family can bring, not just to the house of God, but to your world as well. And so whether it's money or our time, whether it's uh, attention or any of those things, we're going to kind of unpack that in a minute. So yeah. it's been focused on money, but now let's kind of go a little wider here. Yeah, so one of the things uh, before we branch too far, um, Jeremiah, we get a question a lot about tithing. Do, yes. you, do you have to tithe? Yes, yes, we get that, that question a lot. And most of the time when people ask us uh, that question, do, do I have to tithe? Um, I actually love, just like that. I love that question. Please come and ask me that question after this service. I will have a conversation with you. And I, I'll listen to you, but listen, here's the thing. If someone says, do I have to tithe? My response is going to be, well, Jesus didn't just ask for 10%. He asked for 100%. Because he said... If you want to be my disciple, let him deny himself 100% and come take up his cross and follow me. So if we're, if we're looking at scripture and if you kind of want to skirt around it by saying it's an Old Testament thing, then I would ask you to check your heart. Amen. Like, are you willing to follow God even when it's painful to you? Okay, wait, I got one for him. Hmm. Parents. You have all tried to train your children on what is healthy to eat at the dinner table. If I have chicken and potatoes and broccoli in front of my children and I ask them to eat and they know that ice cream is following, they will ask me for the ice cream first because they are children. They don't want the meal. They want the sundae, right? Okay, so here, now listen to this. As parents, we say... You need to eat your broccoli first before you get the dessert. And as a child, what is the response? How much do How I have to? How many pieces do I have to eat before I get the ice cream? <laughs> See, our response is the same a lot of times as adults with God when it comes to giving, whether it's our time, our treasure, or our talents. How much do I have to do to get your blessing, God? Or to get to heaven, or to get somebody's attention at the church, or to whatever the case may be. Do you follow? There's a, there's a, a heart check that's got to happen in us because we are all programmed like that. Your pastors included. We have to continually fight against that because we're not called to be greedy or stingy, but to be generous. And we, we have to lead the charge. So for us, it's an important thing that we have to continually press ourselves because we have the same thing in our hearts. How much do I really have to do here, God? When we get to that spot, what we realize is, is that it's not about how much we give, but it's that our hearts are wrong. And we need to bring those hearts to God and let him heal us and, and restore us and get us back to the right spot with our giving. Now, what happens when the child doesn't eat the broccoli? No ice cream. No ice cream. If you keep in your word. Can I just share with you? When we don't give, there's no ice cream. <laughs> and, it, and that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that we, as a church, that won't bless you if you don't give to the church. If you heard that, throw that out. We we listen to James when he says you need to bless everyone, whether they give or not. Everyone should be treated the same in God's house. That's not what she's saying here. What we're talking about is how God responds to you is different. <laughs> Just like a parent who's trying to teach their children that what they don't want is good for them, giving is the same thing. Our Father is trying to teach us that giving is good for you. That, that if you eat your veggies, if you give freely, you're going to begin to see blessings that you've not experienced to this point. And so that, that it, it helps us unlock it because I think a lot of us kind of come with that attitude um, to giving, and it's, it's, it's kind of just human nature. Well, it's difficult because we put a value on those time, treasure, and talents 
that is not God's value. Okay? So, for instance, how many of you have ever spent some time with someone? Um, maybe they, they are closed in or in a nursing home, and you, you had 10 minutes, but you stopped in, you gave them a hug, you blessed them with 10 minutes of your time. See, you valued your 10 minutes much differently than how they valued Amen. your 10 minutes. It was just a little 10 minute stint, but you were the first person they've seen in weeks that they knew. Do you see? There's, there's a, there's, this is God's economy. And for those of us that don't give in this way, we never experience it. So we just go and say, well, giving doesn't work and God doesn't meet my needs and God, I, I've never seen this. But this is the reality of those that walk in generosity uh, we begin to see God multiply everything, not just our finances, but our time, talent, treasure. Have you ever known somebody that you're like, how did they get all that done? Like, how did these people do this? They've got the same 24 hours that we do, right? But there's so much that gets accomplished in their day. Now, there's another part to this that's important that we <laughs> did cover in the first service as well. But for us to be generous, there's another element. Every time we speak about giving, we're also going to speak about this at least briefly. <laughs> And that is stewardship. Yeah. Can I get an amen from those of you that are stewards? If we're haphazard with the way we treat our money, then we're going to get a haphazard result in what our money does for us. Amen? amen? Those who put and invest time and energy in learning how to use their money instead of having their money use them, it's, going to be, it's hard to be generous when you've got credit card bills that are, are, are strangling you. Amen? So there's an element of this where, you know, yeah, I want to be generous, but are you going to be a good steward, too? Same with time. The people that are, can do all these things is because they're good stewards of their time as well as generous. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's important you hear that because you can be generous all day long, but if, you, if, you're, if you're dying because you're making bad decisions with your money, well, that has to be addressed, too. And God will help you with that as well. Uh, God's helped us over the years, and oftentimes we have to keep coming back to it. Uh, but that, that's a really important... Uh, one last thing about this story before we move on to the next verse. And I want you to hear this very carefully. One thing I love about Jesus speaking about money, and he spoke about money more than just about anything else while he was here on earth. But one thing I love about Jesus when he spoke about money is this. He always empowered the poor. Think about it. It was the richest among them that was most challenged by Jesus' teaching. And so if you're here this morning and you're like, you know what, I'm poor. Like, I can't give because I don't have. But guess what? Jesus' teaching empowers you more than anyone else. Because even though it's not two million dollars, your two mites go a lot farther. If you give with the heart that we're talking about today, freely and open, realizing that even the little that you have comes from a God who is trying to teach you to be generous. So Jesus' teaching is good for us. Those of us that are, are below the poverty line or in the middle, you know, uh, lower middle bracket, whatever, it's, it's good for us. It's meant to be an encouragement. And I love that because he, he brought the widow to their attention that day. But there's a, with the heart and the wisdom, it, you apply the same God principles no matter what your income is. Whether you're rich or poor, it all affects and, us. And same. once again, that is, that's what Jesus is talking about here is our heart. And so I think sometimes we deal too much in the spirit of lack, especially in this area. We are victims to the spirit of lack. When, when people aren't affluent, uh, it becomes easier to feel like you never have enough. Amen? I mean, let's be honest. When, when, we're, when, we're, when we don't have a lot to work with, it's harder for us to feel affluent or feel like there's lots to go around. But Paul told us that we should be content in all things. And I, I think that there's an aspect of our spiritual life that we really need to challenge, uh, be challenged with. You know, when you think about, um, so I'm, I am going to be 40. Um, when you think about immaturity, and, and I don't mean this in a negative way, if you are uh, 
before your 20s or early 20s, but a lot of times you work for the weekend. Everybody's working for the weekend. Thanks, Dad. I see Chris Farley in my head. Uh, but the, that's the truth. It's like, you know, you, you, you have an idea about what you're getting through the, the week for so that then you can spend your money and have a good time. But as you get older... It works for a while for a lot of people. But as you get older and more mature, you understand that your money and your time, it should be geared towards your future. And you didn't even know those things existed, but all of a sudden, family and having investments and retirement and like all those things start to come in and then you start to realize, hey, whoa, there's more here than I even saw. That is the progression. Yeah. Well, our spiritual maturity with the Lord is the same. Sometimes we are just uh, so excited to have something happen that we give our time, our talent, or our treasures <laughs> without an understanding of that value. And the Holy Spirit really wants you to hear your value today, that what you have to offer is valuable in all of those situations, in all of those circumstances, whether it is with your time, your money, or your talent. I think sometimes we throw our talent out the window, but God created you with special gifts so that you can add flavor and blessings to the world around you. And it's a resource. Only you can provide. Amen. <laughs> Only you can give if you give your time or energy in a certain way. Um, whenever, whenever I love the worship team and their heart to serve, I mean, they get here at like 7 o'clock in the morning, some at 6 for prayer. And they're giving something very specific that not a whole lot of people can offer. That when they make that choice, that is giving just as much as writing a check or doing anything else. Um, that, that is giving your time, it's giving your energy. Here's one, I, here, I, and I just really want to focus on this for a second because um, I think it might set some people free, and that's our, our attention. I mentioned this before, but there's a reason why it's pay attention. Because attention is a resource. Ask any three-year-old that wants his mommy and it's a resource that that child is wanting from their parent, amen? Yeah. I was thinking about this because like, um, you know, I'm, I'm uh, 43 and there, there was a time when dad coming home from work was way different than it is now. Can we be honest? There was a time where um, dad came home from work and like, <laughs> Mom pushed the kids out the door. I'm not saying this is just in my house, but like it, it was just normal. You know, dad's coming home, be quiet, he wants rest. Then everybody would go out the door, you know, and dad would come home and, you know, we, we, dad kind of said this. He said, um, I've worked all, what? Yeah. It was the father's privilege to say that, okay? I've worked all day. And now I want to rest. Now, is it important for us to get rest? Absolutely. But can I tell you something? The children need our attention. And you have not worked all day. There is still plenty of day left that you could invest in your children. They need and want your attention. But if you are not generous with your attention, your response will be, Jimmy, be quiet. I'm trying to watch something. I'm, I'm on Netflix right now. I'm binging for seven hours, right? Come on, this, this hits me too. The question is not whether or not we do those things. It's not wrong to watch and binge Netflix. But are we giving to our children what they deserve? If our employer gets the best energy and time in our week, we're doing it all wrong. Our children, our wives, our family, our husbands should get the best of our energy next to God and the best of our attention. And if you don't get anything else this morning, maybe, you know what, maybe you're not ready to make the jump with your finances, 
I'm just going to trust God to continue to deal with your heart, but here's something that doesn't cost you a cent. Click. Did you know your phone has an off button? It's amazing, right? It's crazy. But when we turn off the phones and spend time with our kids, an amazing thing happens. They stop being crazy. Well, some of them, okay? There are some, some kids you got to pray a little extra hard for. But the fact of the matter is that our kids are often acting out because they're not getting the attention that we should be giving on the front end. Does that make sense? So just that heart of generosity, this, this plays out in way more than just money, guys. And if you're like, well, this sounds like a whole lot of giving. Yeah. Okay. We're supposed to give all of it. Yeah, and I, I hear um, a lot of times I, I give and I give and I give and I give. Keep going, bucko. <laughs> okay, if you say that, then it, it's like a, it's a red flag that it's your heart. And there are moments where I say that in my own home. I give and I give and I give and I clean and I give and I give and I give. And I'm like, oh, this sounds horrible. How many dishes can one family make? It's all about the laundry. It's all about the laundry, right? Oh, so, my goodness. So with this... Every act of ge humble generosity, though, helps others see God. And we're training our kids. Yeah. We're, we, we are... We're showing them how to be salt and light. And how to do the laundry, too. <laughs> That's important, too. Amen? Yeah, you can preach all that all before, before we close, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 and 19. It says, Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. This is the next, this is a great part. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. We just stop for a moment. He doesn't tell us he gives us what we need to survive. He gives us what we need for our enjoyment. If you are living a life that is just surviving, trust the Lord for the next part that he wants to give to you as you live your life generously. It says, tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience, next two words, true life. They say you can't take it with you when you die. And it's a fact that I've never seen a U-Haul trailer behind a hearse. Every grave that I have stood next to is about the same size. And it doesn't matter how much wealth you accrue or amass or what things are in your life that come and go. At the end of the day and at the end of your life, what matters most is what you did with the things that God gave you. It starts by realizing that everything we have, be it little or much, comes from our Creator God. Amen. Not for you, but for others. When we get that, our selfish part dies. Crucified with Christ, so that we can live the generous lives He's called us to. This morning, my heart and my prayer is that no one will walk out of here saying all they did was ask for money. I'm not asking you for money. My question is, have you given God your heart to the point where you'll allow him to stretch you in your ability to give? Are you willing to follow God even when it doesn't benefit you, but when it benefits someone else? If I don't ever ask you that question, I'm not your pastor. I amount to nothing more than a televangelist. Jesus was more concerned about the person's heart 
than how much they gave. So this morning, I want to ask if every head would bow and every eye would close today, because this is a private thing. If this morning the Holy Spirit has moved in your heart and you realize that maybe you're struggling with what we're talking about, maybe it's maybe you're, it's hard to, to give. Maybe you don't see the value in it. Maybe when you walked in here today, you, you've been guilty of saying all they ever do is talk about money in church. And today, you want to leave that behind. If it's possible, you want to leave that behind. I want to challenge you to respond in this next moment. So if that's you this morning, with every head bowed and every eye closed, would you just raise your hand right where you are to say, I want to leave the need for money behind. I want to turn away from God, uh, turn away from everything else being my source, and I want God to be the source in my life. If that's you, would you slip your hand up right where you are to say that that's me today? I know there's somebody. Thank you. Anyone else? No. Yeah. Thank you, God. You can put your hands down. The spring of water is not the source. God is the source. And when the spring of water becomes our God, <coughs> our source goes away. So God, we come to you today and we say we, we want to repent of seeing the things in our lives as ours in the first place, myself included. For every time that I have held something close to me and said, it's mine, I don't want to give it up. I don't want to give it. God, would you forgive me? Thank you for your grace that is so quick to forgive. But God, I don't want to just stay there. I don't want to continue that mindset. God. I truly want to move into a next next level of generosity. For everybody in here, whether you give a lot or a little, whether you feel like you're already moving, if you would say, I want to move to the next level of being a contributor, this, oh, this is your, your moment right now. If that's you, and you'd say, I just want to move to the next level. I want to challenge myself to sacrifice and to give at the next level. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit talk to me about it. If that's you, would you slip your hand up right where you are? Say, that's me. I don't want to just give haphazardly or just a little bit out of my extra. I want, to, I want to ask God to speak to me about what will really truly challenge me. And then I want to be faithful in, in doing that thing. Whatever that is. It doesn't mean given to the church. It might be given to somebody around you or whatever. I don't know. Time, talent, treasure. You're just open. Wow. This is a world-changing moment. Because every act of generosity in our lives shows God to someone else. God, we have raised our hands today because our hearts want to align with you. I'm asking God that your Holy Spirit would speak to us so that we can do this consistently. God, I ask it in Jesus' name. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. One.